Dr. Schwartzbein states that, again, combined continuous is like pregnancy and increase the risk of breast cancer. So she's like, well, that would be like I'm pregnant, and I don't want to hire breast cancer. Well, it's interesting that the, the basically has the, the combined continuous not, is the opposite of pregnancy. It's not like pregnancy, and it's strong associated with breast cancer prevention. So women with multiple pregnancies have a lifetime exposure to estrogen and progesterone that is 1.5 to 3 times that of women who have never been pregnant. So when you're pregnant, what goes up high? Estriol, progesterone. So compared to a woman who has been, uh, not been pregnant, a woman who has been pregnant has much, much higher lifetime exposure to estrogen and progesterone. Now if they cause cancer, they should have higher levels of cancer. They have much lower levels. So it doesn't make sense that estrogen, natural estrogen and progesterone cause cancer. So here's um, some factors, again, associated with pregnancy. The high estriol, again, in the progesterone, known to reduce a woman's risk. Some things from the National Cancer Institute. The younger a woman has her first child, the lower the risk of developing breast cancer during her lifetime. So the more estriol, the more progesterone, the, lo the lower your cancer risk. A uh, woman who has her first child after the age of 35 has approximately twice the risk of developing breast cancer than a woman who has a child before 20. Again, that early, all that estrogen, estriol, est progesterone is protective. Having more than one child decreases a woman's chance of developing breast cancer, and particularly having more than one child at a younger age developing breast cancer during the lifetime. So again, high levels are protective. She also states that combined continuous with natural progesterone cause insulin resistance. Again, this is certainly not true, but it is true with progestins. It's been demonstrated not to be the case with natural progesterones. A couple of studies here. And I have, we follow insulin levels very closely, and I've followed estro, uh, the insulin levels on thousands of women on the combined continuous, and we see a decline in insulin, not an increase in insulin resistance. And we watch that very closely. Again, it's been, been shown that not the, the continuous progesterone that results in increased insulin resistance, but the effect of oral estrogen. And I think that's what she was talking about in her, her experience, increased insulin was probably from using the oral estrogen. The 1993 study found that, again, oral estrogen increased insulin resistance while the transdermal did not. Again, reason to use the transdermal. Oral, here's a quote from Metabolism 1993. Oral estrogen therapy caused a deterioration of glucose tolerance and increased overall plasma insulin response, while the transdermal regimen had relatively uh, few effects on insulin metabolism. So it's the opposite of what's said in the book. In a study published in 2002 Journal of Diabetic uh, Care looked at the effect of oral estrogen and continuous progesterone had on insulin resistance. So this is exactly what she says will increase insulin resistance. 28 postmenopausal women were given oral estrogen with, with or without continuous progesterone. So we'll see what the effect is on the continuous progesterone matched with women who are not taking any hormones. The authors concluded that the postmenopausal women taking oral estrogen with or without progesterone showed a greater degree of insulin resistance than those not taking hormone replacement therapy, even allowing for total, the, basically, the body fat. So it was not the progesterone at all. It didn't make a difference if you took it cyclic or continuous. It was the oral estrogen. The, and the corporate was the, the corporate was the oral estrogen, not the progesterone. And here's the, uh, basically, glucose utilization. So with estrogen um, and then no HRT in, in this group, estrogen plus progesterone is the same, OK? So no, no difference. And, uh, and while the, uh, it was the oral estrogen that had, had the problem. Okay. So we always get, again, why doesn't my doctor know this? We kind of went through that. Um, doctors generally don't read medical literature. They get their medical literature basically like everyone else, the CNN. And, um, and also the drug reps. They wait for the drug reps to bring the, the, basically the articles. Here's our, new, here's our new drug. OK, what insurance plans is it on? And then they go through. So again, they don't, there's no one looking for, you know, going through the studies. And that's what you hear many doctors say, oh, that's, it's ridiculous. There's no studies on natural hormones. And I think I've shown you that um, there are a lot of studies on natural hormones. Um, and when they, again, read the medical journals, they, they look at the advertisements. And almost no medical, uh, any medical education. You know, you go to the, the Vail uh, seminar and go, go skiing. And, <laughs> David Plumitter, neurologist, uh, he talks a lot about this, and he says, really, doctors, if they're down on what they're not up on, so they don't like to do anything, if they don't do it, it's, it's ridiculous. And again, what you tell uh, people they have been doing for wrong for many years, it's not very receptive. And uh, I said, when I was presenting this, this information to a number of doctors uh, in 1995, 
Um, one doctor's response after going through all the studies is like, I've never heard this before. How bad could it be? Everyone uses it. You know, and that's typically the, the mentality. If everyone's using it, very, it feels very comfortable. And so summary, these studies indicate that res with respect to breast cancer, heart disease, heart attacks, and stroke, natural hormones offer a safer and more conservative approach to hormone replacement. Extensive scientific evidence overwhelmingly demonstrates that natural hormones are safer than the study drugs in the Women's Health Initiative study. I hope I convinced you of that. Unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of women do not know that there are safe alternatives to current hormone replacement. You know, even with Suzanne Summers' book, the overwhelming majority of people aren't even offered this, the, the natural hormones and aren't aware of it. And as you can see, the negative outcomes with the Women's Health Initiative study uh, was no surprise, and, and basically every study has also shown that that, that would, was an expected outcome. And I think that's it. We'll, uh, we'll field questions here. I'll, um, bring uh, Dr. Tenenbaum, Dr. Uh, Sharp, and Whiteman up, and um, if you have any questions, we'll go ahead and answer those. Okay. Thank you. Transdermal is through the skin, so gels, creams. You, oh, you can do um, ultra-vaginal. Would you elaborate on your preference for transdermal progesterone versus uh, transdermal estrogen and why, why you like oral progesterone? You know, when, when you look at the studies with oral estrogen, again, as we talked about, will go through the liver, increase clotting factors, binding proteins. Oral progesterone does not. Now, you can, we do use uh, transdermal progesterone, but really we, majority of time we'll use oral progesterone. You get much higher blood levels. And we know that by because we've checked thousands and thousands of women after they do the, the progesterone creams. Yeah, it does have an effect, but the problem is you don't get a big blood level. And, uh, and so I also know that people with PMS, you treat them with transdermal progesterone. Yeah, it can help them. But you treat with oral progesterone, much greater improvement. And people will say, like Dr. Lee, they'll say, well, look in the saliva, don't look in the blood. Well, you know, the thing is, what, you know, what brings the hormones to the tissues? Is it the blood or the saliva? You know, it, it's, it's the blood. And we've, and I think there was a question earlier about saliva testing. And for uh, about a year, I went through almost everyone that came through the clinic. I tested them with uh, blood, 24-hour urine, and saliva. And I found the blood and 24-hour urine correlated pretty well, and saliva was all over the board. So, you know, theoretically, saliva checks the free levels. There are, are arguments that it can be used, but, but in practical sense, it can really lead you astray. Okay, another issue is with progesterone, the dose uh, estrogen we can use on the cream, but the dose of progesterone is over 100 times that amount of the estrogen. So it's hard to penetrate that much through the skin. It's a lot easier to take it orally. So she wants to know where bioidentical hormones come from. And they're plant-based, but there are no bioidentical hormones in plants. So it has to be altered. You know, say, well, that makes it synthetic. Well, no, your body cannot tell the difference. And we think of that's the problem. What does natural mean? Does it mean herbs? Does it mean, you know, animal? Um, you know, natural, you know, herbs are not bioidentical. So your body has never seen these. They don't work in the same receptors. So bioidentical hormones are plant-based, but they are, they are changed in the lab to be bioidentical. Exactly the same molecule. Your body, they synthesize it basically the same way that your body does through cholesterol. You know, it just, it, it very, you know, yams is a big one for progesterone because it's very close to progesterone, but like yam creams, there's no progesterone yams. It's one step away. Uh, one of the